Hi, welcome to PCW Rewind. I'm your host, CQ. This is where we get to take a look back at all of my favorite interviews and guest appearances from my live show, Pop Culture Warrior. Uh, just so you know, you can catch us live every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern on pretty much every social media platform. Just search for us at WTF Nation Radio. And if you're new to this channel, I mean, consider checking out some of the other awesome interviews we've done um, and show your support. Drop a like, subscribe, you know, one of those things. Hit one of those buttons. In this episode, I got to sit down and chat with director Rod Lurie. He's an incredibly accomplished film director who's had a tremendous amount of experience in the film and TV industry. Starting out as an investigative reporter in the entertainment industry and film critic in the 90s. Uh, he's written and directed numerous titles, including The Contender, Straw Dogs, The Last Castle, and many more. Uh, his most recent movie is The Outpost, which tells the true story of the events leading up to and including the Battle of Cam Camdish in Afghanistan, where a small unit of U.S. soldiers defended against an overwhelming force of over 400 Taliban fighters in what was one of the most bloody American engagements of the Afghanistan war. The battle resulted in two living service members, uh, Ty Carter and Clint Romeshaw, uh, being awarded the Medal of Honor, which is the first time that's happened in nearly 50 years. This was an extremely powerful interview because not only did Rod give us a peek behind the movie and the film industry as a whole, he also shared some of the truly heartbreaking personal losses he suffered during the making of this film. So without further ado, please enjoy the Pop Culture Warrior interview of director Rod Lurie. Uh, my guest tonight is an accomplished director in Hollywood with a particularly interesting backstory. Um, he was born in Israel, uh, but moved uh, to the United States at a young age, growing up in Greenwich, Connecticut, as well as Honolulu, Hawaii. He is a 1984 West Point graduate, former air defense artillery officer in the United States Army. Uh, after his time in service, he worked as an entertainment reporter for the New York Daily News and a freelance magazine writer. He relocated to Los Angeles and wrote for the uh, Los Angeles Magazine, published a book, became the film critic for KABC Radio in 1995. He then transitioned into filmmaking by writing and directing his first feature film, Deterrence, which is a political thriller. And in only his second feature, The Contender in 2000, he directed John, uh, Joan Allen and Jeff Bridges to Oscar nominations. He's also directed the movies The Last Castle, Nothing But the Truth, and Straw Dogs, as well as a number of other TV projects as well. So most recently, he's directed The Outpost, the story of the 53 United States soldiers who battled the force of roughly 400 enemy insurgents in northeastern Afghanistan during Operation Enduring Freedom in 2009 a battle in which eight men lost their lives, numerous were wounded, and two men came out of it with a Medal of Honor. So please, everybody, welcome to the show, Director Rod Lurie. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you, man. I'm very, very, very happy to be with you. Uh, Thank you. I'm, I'm over the moon, so excited. Um, <laughs> so um, before we really dive into the movie proper, I, mm -hmm. I really want, I, I spent some time reading up on you and, and, and kind of your career and what you did. I want the audience to understand you just a little bit. Uh, I want them to understand you a little bit more. So right. uh, your father is yes. a military veteran of Israel. Yes, um, he is. And from, and from what I gathered, he worked as a political cartoonist, which includes yeah. illustrations of Life magazine. Um, yeah. and, and according to Guinness Book World of Records, He's the most widely syndicated political cartoonist in the world. Yeah, of all time. That is of all time. His uh, name is Ranan, R-A-N-A-N, Lurie. And, uh, you know, but I, I think that he will always identify as a soldier. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, above uh, above anything else. And he was, uh, he was, you know, that's a studly army, and those are tough motherfuckers. You know? <laughs> he's a, can I say that on your show? Absolutely. Oh, go go <laughs> bananas. You're, you're absolutely and, welcome uh, to you know, and um, the, the stories of valor that come out of that particular army are pretty extraordinary because when my dad was fighting in 1967 and in 1956 and, you know, even during the War of Independence in 1949, um, 
and uh, and then in 1973, the, the odds were always stacked against those guys. Yeah. And, um, you know, they were they were they were having their Thermopolis, you know, almost every day and uh, and always succeeding. And so, you know, it's boy, I grew up hearing some unbelievable war stories yeah, as I was growing up. It was pretty amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now, again, for, for the folks at home to add to just for good measure. On top of that, your mother was also considered the most successful real estate agent in Greenwich, Connecticut. Is that true? No, that is not true. <laughs> She's the most successful real estate agent in Connecticut, period, and maybe Ooh. even the United States. Wow. It's not it's not difficult to be the most successful in America when you're a real estate agent in Greenwich, Connecticut, because like, for example, she sold the Trump home. Oh, Don't wow. You know, you know, that, you know, and she sold, I mean, there are just a ton of, you know, multi-billionaires that live in, uh, in Greenwich. And so she's selling routinely homes that are worth 30 to $50 million. And so, yeah, she's uh, incredibly successful. Um, and probably the most, she's 81 years old and she is still not just selling real estate, but driving uh, into Greenwich every day and just selling the hell out of that stuff. That's and doing phenomenal. Some amazing Yep, the best, the best uh, that one of the best realtors that baby has ever lived. Wow! So I'm very, proud of, I'm very proud of her. You come from some some solid stock, is what I was what I'm what I'm getting at, right? Like you, you've... I'm a, I'm a, I'm a black sheep of the highest order. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm out I'm 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 out right now with a number one movie in America and a really well reviewed film, and I, and I'm still like, uh, you know, the black sheep. So. <laughs> I don't, I don't know you, what it's going to take. You're the unsuccessful guy, right? It's like, hey, when are you going to pick it up? When are you going to, you know, when are you, when are you going to really break through? <laughs> my, my brother, his name is Barack. Oh, and, um, right. and And he is a conservative radio talk show host in, in Los Angeles. And in fact, his wife's middle name is Michelle and his daughter's name is Sasha and his name is Barack. And wow. when we went to high school, uh, we were a year behind Obama. So the... Um, so he's really successful too. He's a very, very successful lawyer and conservative, conservative radio talk show host in in LA. Wow, that's phenomenal. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this: so, as both an accomplished film director and TV director, what yeah. what are some of the let's say the major differences in directing between those two um, that like us, the general audience, doesn't really know about or get to see? Well, generally speaking, in television. Um, the schedule is much, much shorter. Like every episode you'll see of a, of a one hour show, um, routinely it's eight days, um, for, um, you know, when you're making a movie, a two hour movie is routinely, you know, about 40 days, uh, right. on average 45 days. And so you have to move, move with much, much more speed when you're making a television show than when you're making a movie. And so, you know, greater compromises, um, are made along the way, especially in terms of the cinematography, in terms of uh, the in terms of the lighting, and you know, and sometimes actors don't get as many takes as they like to get performances. Just so, regardless of that, you know, there have been some just unbelievable art in in television recently. But that that I would say is is one of the uh, principal differences. And generally speaking, you you have a, a smaller budget on TV than you do in in movies. Mm -hmm. Well, there have been many, many great low-budget films. The Outpost, uh, the movie that is out right now, was, uh, you know, I, I would say it cost less than a, a normal TV show. Right. So, you know, so so despite the fact that of these differences, which I just relate to you, it's not it's not always the, it's not always the case. Well, one of the you know, there's a, there is another interesting difference, which is. That whenever you make a film, you always say, oh, damn, I really wish I had done this or I had done that. You know, you, I, I want a do-over. Right. On, on, you know, there's no such thing as a filmmaker who doesn't want to remake their film they just made. Right. I, I can tell you I would do a ton of shit differently in the outpost now <laughs> right. um, if, I, if I had an opportunity. Um, but in TV, you get that opportunity because you go from one episode to the next. And although you can't redo an episode you can improve from episode to episode. Right. Generally speaking, when you look at the first episode, it's called a pilot. Um, the second or third episodes are usually better because we learn from the mistakes of the first one or we 
or we, we learn to accentuate what we did well in the first one um, into those second or third episodes and, and down the line. Right. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, so, and, and guys, if you have questions, absolutely put them in the chats. I'm seeing them and I'm going to get to them. I want to get through these first few and then, and then we'll, we'll take some audience questions too. Um, you have worked with, I mean, let's be honest, a lot of like Hollywood heavyweight, Jeff Bridges, uh, Christian Slater, uh, Robert Redford, James Gandolfini, Kate Beckinsale, Matt Dillon, Angela Bassett, Alan Alda, David Schwimmer, Gina Davis. Yep. I mean, the list yep. goes on and on. Um, yes, sure does. <laughs> that's pretty good. I didn't read, I didn't even, you know, I never yeah. laid it out like that. I, I'll tell you. And now with the outpost, you get Orlando Bloom, Scott Eastwood, yes. Caleb Landry yes. Jones, and, and a bunch of others, a bunch of others. Um, right. For you, what has been some of like those highlights and maybe some of the lowlights between directing, let's call them established talent versus those new up and comer, those undiscovered talents that you're that you're directing? Well, you know, you know, in the in the outpost playing uh, specialist Ty Carter, the recipient mm-hmm. of the medal. Is uh, Caleb Landry Jones, and you probably had, had no clue uh, before this film, anyway, who he was. You'd be surprised. <laughs> and, and well, I mean, most people have absolutely right. no idea who he was, although they've seen them in movies like Get Out. Right. They saw him in a movie like Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. And um, I guess he was in one, in one of the X Men films. Yep, he was Banshee but, in one of the X Men films, that's right. Yeah, no, but you know, he's an unknown actor. I can I can tell you that. Like whenever I went to a restaurant with him, uh, literally not one person would ever right. stop us at all. And you know, and he's hungry, and he's you know extraordinarily uh, committed. And so he gets on he gets on the set of the outpost. We can talk more about this down the line because sure. his his process was was pretty un, un, simply unbelievable. But he has turned in, in my opinion, maybe the best combat performance of all time. I don't mean necessarily the best war performance, the best combat performance. Like when you see this kid in combat, the performance that he gives and the emotions that he puts out and the awareness of the hell around him, the tragedy um, around him are, uh, you know, they're, they're simply, it's simply remarkable. And I, you know, I would not at all be surprised if he gets nominated for the Academy Award for for our film. I, I certainly would uh, would love to see it. So Absolutely. when you have somebody new, when you have somebody CQ, when you've got somebody new like him, it's just like an absolute delight to to behold. Now you go to some of these, you call them established actors. Some of them are like living legends, like like Robert Redford. Sure, right? absolutely, and. You know, those are guys that are teaching you a thing or two <laughs> as you're going, as you're going down the line, and you know, obviously, I've got anecdotes and stories about uh, about you know every every single one of them, um, and 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 sometimes you just you know you yell action and and you and you remember why they are as great as 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 great as they are, right. why they are you know. Uh, the best of the best. One of my favorite stories is is this. Um, so I'm gonna make. I was gonna make a movie. It's my second film. You talked about. It. It's called The Contender, mm-hmm. and Contender. It's a political movie, and and I had offered the role of the President of the United States to Paul Newman, um, and uh, Newman at the time wasn't even reading. He was retired, and so it was a no go. And so then I was told, what about Jeff Bridges? And, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is Jeff Bridges. This is not a comedy about the president. It's, <laughs> it's going to be real. Right. And, you know, and, and Jeff had always played these supremely laid back guys. Most specifically, he had just played the dude in The Big Lebowski. <laughs> That's are right. You familiar? Absolutely. Are you familiar with Absolutely. You are? So, so I'm not sure if I want to cast uh, Jeff in it. And so I go up to Malibu. Uh, I'm not to Malibu, to Santa Barbara, where he lives. Uh, it was a Saturday morning, 10 a.m., and uh, I knock on his door, and he answers the door, and he is in his big Lebowski outfit. <laughs> now, see, I, I'm not talking about 
a, a Big Lebowski like outfit. I'm talking about he's wearing the Big Lebowski, like outfit. the exact one, the exact outfit. He said, and he says to me in, in his with that draw, no man, you know, it, Lebowski was wearing my clothes, not the other way around. <laughs> And he invites me in, and now I'm going to test your Lebowski uh, IQ. All right. He says to me, would you like a drink? And I say, as a joke, I say, yes, I would like, what kind of drink did I ask for? The milk. No, no. Man, no. no. White Russians. White Russians. That, well, that's Wait, why I was no, thinking milk. <laughs> hey, let me tell you something, Amigo. Everybody in your audience right now got that, and you didn't. I, I know. I promise you. I know. Okay, so, he, so now here's the thing. I don't drink. I drink zero. I, I have never in my life had a full drink. And uh, and I mean that. And, and not since my bris when the rabbi gave me a little bit of wine. I've <laughs> never had a drink. All right. So, so, so Jeff comes out with six white Russians and two croissants. <laughs> and since I don't drink, he consumes all the white Russians. Oh, and he is good and toasted by the end of uh, the meal. The meal. The <laughs> right end of the <laughs> Yeah, of the croissants. And so he walks me to my car and he puts his arm around me and he says, you know, the dude is president. Who would have ever dreamed it? And um, and you know what? A year and a half later, he was nominated for the Academy Award for that role. That's so wow. it was it was it was it was it was pretty cool. So, look, you know, I, I have been a cineast my entire life. Um, uh, when I grew up, all I wanted to do was to be involved in the movies and and now i i found myself working with the actors that i consider to be the best actors who some of the best actors who have ever lived Absolutely. and um, it's it's pretty mind boggling actually that's pretty incredible great. um i got one more for you before we dive into the movie uh at a proper um so i read that you had a dream project one day making a movie about west point and that, yeah. and that you had had a deal at one point with Universal to make That's a movie right. called Heart of a Soldier, and that it yes. was set to it was set to star Paul Walker and Jessica Alba. Yes. Now, That's obviously, a, sorry. Go ahead. That's very good. Now, yeah, good, uh, good intel. Yeah. <laughs> so now, obviously, the the it fell apart, and, and I think it was mostly due to that was right around the time the the Iraq War broke out. Um, yes. Is so. My question for you is: Is that still a dream project and if so um who who's that uh who's that paul walker jessica alba looking like uh today well th those are well the i'm gonna i'm gonna cut off the second part of the question because the first part is yes um it is a dream project to do something at west point but it is not hard of a soldier okay i, I want to do i want because that was somebody else's script um that um, I participated in a little bit, but it was basically somebody else's script. It was a very good script, and it was it was um, a love story um, about um, you know a young woman who um, is a debutante who meets a, who meets a West Point cadet, and you know they fall in love, and you know they're it's sort of a wrong side of the track sort of uh, sort of movie. Gotcha. I want I want to do um, a boxing epic at, at West. Point. Yeah, I've got a very specific story in mind. It is definitely my dream project. I would love to get up uh, up there. Although they they are hard ass about this, they don't allow. They have not had a motion picture shot there. I think since maybe in the early nineteen fifties. Wow. And and we and we were going to shoot Heart of a Soldier there, and they had they had agreed to it, and it, it was a it was a very um, dramatic moment in dramatic moment in, in my life uh, um, uh, I'll tell you I'll tell you a story I don't think I've ever ever told this story before exclusive go uh, ahead drop it on me <laughs> well it is it, it was a sad thing for me because I um, they were very dubious about bringing a film crew up there because they don't want the cadets to have their lives disrupted by by a film crew up there for you know a few months and and that was going to be the case but they read the screenplay, and the and the screenplay itself. After I re, I, I had to rework it. I, I told uh, the guys at Universal they're they're never going to approve the screenplay you have, for various reasons. Give it to me, and and I'll make it what I think will be at least acceptable to them. And we got it to that point. 
but there were, because you know West Point really is the pearl of, of the army. Right. And they don't want anyone to fuck with it or its image or anything like that. Yeah. And they certainly are not going to participate in that. So so we get up there and I meet with um, I, I brought the, the, this crew in from Universal to meet the cadets. And I got to tell you that at the time, the producer and the, and the execs there, you know, they, they're very cynical about the army. They're very cynical about West Pointers. You know, although it's probably one of the best academic institutions on the planet, you know, you know it's not Yale, it's not Harvard to them. And so they come up there and they're going into the classes and it's a very, have you ever, have you ever been up there, CQ? Uh, I've never made it up there, no. It's just, it's a, a very, very impressive place. I've heard. And you go, into the class, you go into the classrooms and, you know, they're being taught at the highest level of academia for, uh, you know, undergraduate study. And... So, and they're meeting with the cadets and they're meeting with the honor, the honor board people and they're very impressed. And finally, we go to, um, we go to meet with the superintendent, three-star general. And he says, you know, he turns to everybody in the room and says, I don't know you guys are Hollywood guys. And he points a finger at me and says, I know you. And he even had a file there, I think, with you know, from when I was a cadet, and I was a very shitty cadet, but I did graduate. <laughs> right. Okay, so that says something. I was I was a shitty cadet, but not as shitty as the five hundred people who didn't graduate. Right. Right. And right. Um, and he says, "You have to look me in the eye and promise me that we're not going to get fucked here." And by that, he meant that we're not going to change the screenplay to reflect badly in the academy. Right. And that if I say we're going to make the movie and they're going to start getting organized with us, we're going to make the movie. And I looked him in the eyes and I said, we are not going to screw you. I promise you, sir. And he goes, in that case, we have a deal. And this was momentous. I'm telling you, not since 1950. Yeah. And the guys at Universal, I don't think they quite grasped how big a deal this was for the Academy. Because if they were going to go in, they were going to go in fully and completely and cooperate and it was going to be a thing of beauty and you know we were all sort of delighted by it and then indeed um, when Bush ordered um, was it uh, Enduring Freedom back then that was at the uh, Iraqi Freedom Iraqi Freedom right yeah, yeah. Operation Iraqi and, Freedom right so he begins Operation Iraqi Freedom begins the shock and awe and you know and at that moment you know that was not as popular a war at all right. as when we had gone into Enduring Freedom. And Universal just cut off the film. They cut it off. And it broke my heart. And I had really been deeply, deeply involved in it. And, you know, Paul Walker uh, was so respectful of it that he almost didn't want to do it because he didn't think that he could plop being the number one cadet at West Point. He didn't know that. <laughs> gravitas yeah it, it's it's funny you know in a way but it's also it tells you something yeah and you know and um so we we're all so deeply into it but they canceled it and i got a phone call from the um colonel the aide to uh, the superintendent who said to me i think like we've been had by you mm. and it was it was the first time that i had wept as an adult because I most certainly, you know, did, did, did when you say you had somebody, yeah, it means that you know you went out to screw them, and that, that's the last thing that uh, yeah that you, I did. You feel you, you what, failed your your mission, you know, you 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 let them down. I, I did, and you know, I tried to convince them to put the movie back up, but they they just they just couldn't pull pull the trigger on it, and it was. Um, it was truly, truly heartbreaking, CQ, and um, and one of the and I've had I've had a few disappointments, uh, quite a few disappointments in, the, in as as a filmmaker, but you know that ranks very, very high high up there. Wow. So I do want to return to West Point. I want to tell my own story. Um, it may be a few years from now, but it's it's going to be absolutely um, electric. I've got a a great concept, I think, 
and and I think it'll be something that the academy would very much go for, and um, you know I'm looking I'm looking for looking forward to doing it one day. Fantastic! No, we we one hundred. I can't wait to hear more about it and, and and see it come to fruition. And I hope you know when that time comes, you know, come back on here and promote you know I'll, promote that movie I'll as well. With, I'll come back whenever you want. No worries. <laughs> hey. Or Get, so far so good. Yeah. Say. Get, so careful, is, you don't ring that bell. You can't unring that bell and <laughs> start getting phone south, calls. Really, this could turn south really fast. I <laughs> um, oh yeah, Bob in the chat said. Uh, I, I'm thinking he. The, um, my interpretation is he's saying that the last movie shot at West Point was the Long Gray Line in 1955. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, the Long Gray Line. Um, yeah, that was a very. And that was with Maureen O'Hara, I think was a very long time ago. All right, so I do want to get into, obviously, the outposts. I'm going to give the fans here a chance to get their uh, words in. So uh, first up, I see Chad wrote, um, you spent a lot of time with some really great veterans while making this movie uh, and in your your career, obviously. But did you manage to get any interview footage for, let's say, maybe like a documentary down the line of either making this movie or the documentary of... This battle. Well, the documentary about the battle has been done by CNN. They've they've got a, they've got two hours of, and, and and it's pretty incredible. And I think you can seek it out on the uh, on the internet. Jay Tapper, who wrote the book The Outpost, also put together the documentary. Um, but we do have a a documentary about the making of the Outpost, and it'll. It'll a be on the DVD that will come out in the middle of August, in the middle of, yeah, a few weeks now. Wow, that's that's amazing. Now that I think about <laughs> we're, it. we're we're very close. <laughs> yeah, we are very close. A couple of weeks away. That's pretty amazing. Um, but also the um, uh, if you go to i if you rent our movie on iTunes, um, they or buy the movie on iTunes, they have. The, um, the, they have the document. They have a bunch of extras, including my director's commentary, and they've got the um, the uh, you know a, the making a behind of. the scenes yeah. making of, and and that's pretty cool because you know there there are a lot of shots in the film where people say you know how how do they do that? Yeah. And you know we don't give away all the secrets, but if you look carefully, you can see a couple of the secrets secrets <laughs> revealed there. That's awesome. Plus, I love it. Plus, they talk, they talk to a lot of the the veterans that were involved in the making of the film. That's awesome. I'm 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 the guy that when I buy a movie, first of all, it's, I bought it because I enjoyed it. But I will day one when I buy it, I'll watch the movie again, and then immediately yeah. after that, we'll watch it again with like director's commentary, and then again yeah. with like you know the behind the scenes and the gag. Or like I I just devour I, these things. I'm I love the same. The same way, dude. One of the things that I did during this pandemic, as I was stuck in my house, I was a. I looked at classic movies I'd never seen before, and two, I looked at. I went through all my DVDs on all the films I had seen and started to listen to the commentary. Now, sometimes the commentary is fantastic and really enlightening, and sometimes mm-hmm. it's like. <laughs> Like like really terrible. Like my friend, my friend Billy Friedkin, who directed The Exorcist and The French Connection, he'll basically just say, you know, there's Gene Hackman standing outside smoking a cigarette. Goes inside. He just he, he's just sort of narrating. <laughs> <He's just> movie, <laughs> you know. Whereas what I will do, and what I think people who are really good at this do, is that they'll tell you how, not just how how it was made, but if if they are really honest and want to give a really great commentary. They'll tell you where they fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> They'll tell you what mistakes they made, and I and I and I tend to do that on my commentaries, including the commentary on the outpost, because I just think it's more interesting for the uh, you know for the viewer and for and for the fan. Absolutely, you know, I'm not trying to. Do, you've already seen the film. I don't need to do a commercial for it. <laughs> now I can tell you the, the I can tell you the, you know the truth. <laughs> like in in the outpost, we cut out a couple of scenes. Um, that I really regret having cut out. Mm. And I will tell you, at the moment where it comes up, here was a scene where so-and-so was supposed to happen, but I, but it, get, it got cut out. Yeah. Sometimes I cut it out, sometimes in one case the studio cut it out, and, um, and I really regret it, and, he, and here's why. I'll never, uh, I will never shit on an actor right. in, a, in a 
in a director's commentary. But you know, we'll t- we'll you know we'll tell stories. <laughs> yeah, we'll tell stories about them. You know, that's right. Funny it's, stories. <laughs> it's all it's only fair. Um, so okay, uh, and really, before I read any more questions, I just want to say, for me personally, I sat down, I watched this movie. Um, I was looking forward to seeing it in, in theaters. Obviously, we weren't able to do that. Um, but I sat in my home and I watched it. I sat there with my wife, who hasn't served, um, uh, and her brother, and I really have to say the movie was incredible. I don't mean this to come off as ass kissy or anything like that. It really just, it was good. And um, it was, honest to goodness, the closest thing I've ever seen in this in this medium that really emulated kind of what my experience was with my unit in combat. Outside of like, you know, Restrepo, which we'll talk about, and, and which was a war documentary, which obviously is capturing the real. Um, right. This is the closest thing that I've seen that I could really say, well, yeah, my deployment was like, you know, I, I'll watch Black Hawk Down with friends and I'll go, well, yeah, you know, my deployment was kind of like that, but not really. It was very different. Or, or you know, watch, you know, uh, 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 was it the Lone Survivor and go, well, like, yeah, we were kind of in that area, but I wasn't you know, a sniper by myself and like all these different. This was one of the first movies I could say, like, no, this is this is what it was like. We were just a bunch of well, dudes out there. Well, first of all, so you thank you very much for saying that. And uh, the truth of the matter is that this is a really, really well-reviewed film, just objectively. It's a 93% on that thing they call Rotten Tomatoes. Right. And they, so it's, you know, we've had a lot of reviews. They're mostly all positive. Um, but the best reviews, most important reviews, are the ones that I see on Twitter and on Facebook from vets like yourself. And I have yet to read a single one that takes opposition to the film. And I've read thousands now <laughs> and it's, um, and, and I can, and for me and for, you know, Jay Tapper, mm-hmm. uh, the CNN, um, anchor who uh, wrote the book upon which this is based, probably the most pro military guy in all of journalism. He and I, we both read these things and they mean everything to us, everything. And it's, um, and when people say that, that we got it right, um, we really appreciate that, and we can talk a little bit how we got it right. Mm-hmm. But I, I will tell you that one of the, the one of the first things we did is everyone came to my house. All the American-based people came to my house, and we watched Restrepo. Right. And Restrepo is an incredible, as a piece of art, it's incredible, and it's so human. It's so real, and. And and I brought a guy named Hank Hughes, who ultimately plays Brad Larson in the film. He himself was a um, a lieutenant uh, at out, uh, Combat Outpost Keating. Um, came and spoke with all the all these actors who have come to my house to watch Restrepo with us, and just went over the reality of it and why people do what they do in in the movie. Like, uh, for example, um, were you ever in any Shura meetings? Do you ever do that? Uh, I, I, I pulled a lot of uh, do, uh, guard duty for them. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was never so, in the meeting. <laughs> so, right. So, okay. But that was important too. You know, like we have people on guard duty at the, at the Shura. Yeah. And how and how is that done? And we wanted that to be as specific as possible. But, you know, Orlando Bloom would watch it and see how the officer, the captain in that movie is, is conducting the Shura. So did Milo Gibson, who plays Cap, Captain Yeskis. And so, you know, so we watch that in Cornegal. We also watch, mm-hmm. we watch, you know, these documentaries. That was much more important to us than um, the, the narrative films about um, about war, even true, even true stories, because we we really, really sought out for this thing to be as real as it possibly could be, uh, CQ. And um, so, thank you for saying that we accomplished that. Absolutely. And. Uh, and, but but we did, and you know we had, you know, Ty Carter was on set with us and wow. showed us exactly what he did in the Battle of Kamdesh, and I mean exactly. Right. He was he was running with Caleb, saying, "About here, I stop breathing," you know, and this is how we held the stretcher, and this is the I, and now I opened the I opened the door to the LRAS two with my right hand, not my left hand. And he and he shot those two dudes a little further back than where they are. And so 
you know, we had all this authenticity. Daniel Rodriguez, um, who was a specialist during the yep. battle camp in the, in the mortar pit, he played himself, CQ. He played him fucking self. Incredible. And, and yeah, and so he brought that authenticity. Plus, we had um, a man named Jericho Denman and his partner, Ray Mendoza, who were like these absolutely brilliant, brilliant, um, you know, military and tech advisors who not only put our guys through a boot camp, you know, that's a whole story unto itself, but, you know, uh, you know, he, he was there showing us like how everything from how the cots would be, uh, you know, you know, ruffled to how the men would hold their weapons to how, you know, how well shaven, how, how, how unshaven could they possibly get? You know, it, it was every fucking nook and cranny. You know, those guys wouldn't let me off the hook on anything. And sometimes it was a real pain in the ass. But ultimately, the end result is this really authentic film. And so, you know, and so I, I, I really am thankful to those uh, two, two little fuckers because they helped us a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really all adds to uh, the authenticity of the film and just how grounded and real it felt. Um, right. And, and I, well, I you know, go ahead. Sorry. Well, what I was going to say is that, you know, I, I'm really, I, I want to linger on this CQ because um, it, it really, I know it sounds a little corny, but it's very touching to hear you talk about that. And it's very touching to hear that from the vets. And it's the most important thing I've ever done in my life as a, as a, as a filmmaker is, is not just the outpost, but getting this right within the context of, right. um, of, of the, of the outpost, you know, it was a, um, and the outpost looks like the outpost. And, you know, when we had, um, you know, Stony Portis, who was the, the commander of a Bravo two, three, six, one Cav, when he and the military, the, um, the medical, uh, guru, Chris Cordova, uh, back then Captain Cordova, when they came on our set, they were in, they were in tears, wow. in tears. Um, and they were also there for the day that we shot, um, you know, the big, the big surgical scene in the film. Ty oh, Carter, Medal of Honor recipient, while we were rehearsing the movie, he's walking and he, and he stepped on an air hose and a bang was made and, and he went down, you know. And I, I saw the first time that I saw a military PTS mm. um, in the in that in that form and you know I, I'm I'm guessing that so many people have suffered from this that maybe you have too. Absolutely. And, and it's um th th this shit is real and you know it seems to be more more real with this war than than others. I, I don't quite know why or maybe we're just on the lookout for it more. But so you know so anyway, thank you. That's a long way for me saying thank you for for bringing that up. <laughs> Absolutely, and and honestly, our comments are being filled with uh, like one just came in. Minor details will ruin a whole modern war movie for me. The outpost was spot on. Oh, so, that's so you have, and these are these are guys that are on the ground. These are guys that have lived it. <laughs> bleed it and you know what i mean like it's real this is real uh mo our, the majority of our audience is, is a veteran audience um of course. so i i just I, can't, I have to put out there uh there's a couple vets in the i guess they picked up on your i'll do anything for a vet um so we've got a couple guys uh yeah, taking their shots do anything, yeah, do anything to, uh, <laughs> hold on that's not what i meant you know like not send you money no 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 no, no. Well, veteran organizations i said of course I will, i'll speak to them and <laughs> of course no I mean, we've got we've got uh like one guy who said uh, he's writing a graphic novel about his uh his uh his combat experience uh writing and and and, and doing the artwork it's actually really great we had him on the show so he goes if you ever want to read his graphic novel uh, uh he'd love for you to read it um another guy saying uh, i'm taking a long shot here would you ever consider making a documentary about four crazy paratroopers who are about to row across the Atlantic Ocean. So, um, <laughs> no, would not consider that because that means I gotta get on a boat <laughs> and I get beyond seasick. But that does sound like um, 
like uh, like insane people. Yes, that might, that, that, that that might do that. You are and, spot on. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that sounds very. It sounds uh, very very cool to me. You know, I, I there is a documentary that I'm interested in making, and it's actually I can't really talk about. It. It's based on a book, but it's a, it's a military one. All right. Um, I've never done a documentary before, but I, I eventually would would you know would really would really like to uh, to do that. Okay. Guys, but, okay, I'll give you the uh, rights. You can do mine. I I, I approve. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've already. It's a very specific one. But I. But um, those guys that are in the boat um, need to document every last fucking second of this thing. I I, yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah it's a it's a great. Uh, they're doing it for a good cause and raising awareness for uh, veteran suicide. And uh, I know a little bit about it. One of the guys is going to come on to the show a little later. So. Um, very, very good group of guys. Good for him. That's that's really impressive. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the shit that you guys do, it just it's it just in general is it's so humbling. Look, I when I graduated from West Point in 1984, I graduated into the peacetime army, and you know, and I and I was out by '89, and so I um, I you know I never served in in combat per se. I never had a bullet go past my, you know, my head in combat. I never had to fire at a bad guy. Um, I never risked my life on a, on a battlefield. Now it's not my fault. I, you know, of course. I would have loved to be able to start a war by myself, but I couldn't. <laughs> and um, so, and you know, when, when I go back to my reunions at West Point, a lot of my classmates have been in that situation. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very humbling. I mean, I, I have accomplished, I'm more famous than my classmates, but I'm, you know, I'm not even remotely more important than them. In fact, I'm far less important. I've done much less important stuff than, than they have. And so if I couldn't be on the battlefield with them, then the least I could do then is to try to honor them in this way. And that's why I needed to make a war film that was about this war. Right or the Iraq War because that's the war that my guys um, served in. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's the it's the war of your generation in in, in the sense of the people you served with. Um, a lot of and I, I still have a bunch of questions, but uh, a, a kind of a re um, a question that seems to be popping up in the chats quite a bit in, in some variation or another is with with all of this pressure to get it right. What mm -hmm. was like? how was the decision-making process as far as what gets cut, what doesn't, I mean, like how, how do you make those kind of decisions well, when it's now, real? You know, now you're on to probably um, the most, the most difficult decision to make as a storyteller because Jake's book is several hundred pages long mm -hmm. and it covers uh, outpost Keating for uh, several years and culminates of course with the battle. Right. So, so here here is the reality of filming. I've got two hours. There was talk about making this as a mini series, but that was too difficult to do. And so we decided we made it as a film, which is also very difficult to do, but more doable. And so you have a lead actor upon which the whole movie is predicated, and that would be Scott Eastwood and uh, and then Orlando. And um, you, you know, Scott is playing um, Clint Romeshay. The, uh, the winner, of the, that's not the word you use, the recipient of, right. of the Medal of And um, I apologize for that. No, no. So we sometimes slip. But the, um, and, you know, and but Romashe wasn't there the entire time, but Scott has got to be in the entire film. And I, and I simply don't have time to tell three and a half years worth of, um, of this outpost. I can't have mm. literally... 400 characters coming in and out of it. And so you have to make then a decision that, okay, we want to culminate in the battle. So what we're going to do is we are going to have incidents that occurred in Jay Tapper's book uh, f throughout the course of uh, Keating. Um, but we are going to put it all with 361. So 361 will have commanders in our movie that they didn't have in real life. In real life, they only had, uh, they only had two commanders. Um, one was a guy that was relieved of his duty. And then they had Stoney Portis who came in right before, the, you know, right three weeks, I think, before the battle. 
but so but this was uh, we thought this might be controversial because you know the the army and the army veterans are very um very precious about about these details mm -hmm. so so what i did before i agreed to do the film is i contacted the family of um of ben keating who orlando bloom plays right and and i asked for their permission to put his son to put their son uh, into 361 and i told him why we were doing it and we even said we're even gonna we're even gonna he was the xo of his unit i said we're gonna make him the commander uh it just uh, the storytelling is less confusing that that way right and then we went to the family of uh captain rob Yeskis, who uh was with a different unit but at the but, but at outpost keating and similarly we got their permission and in both cases they really wanted us to do that because they really wanted the stories told of their of their loved ones and it was going to be either that or the movie simply couldn't get made and so those are filmmaking um decisions that that you simply have to make we also had to simplify other things for example there is uh, another outpost at that location called uh, Fritchie that was in the mountains it was an, it was an overlook unit um, that was supposed to provide mortar support in the event of an attack like this and during the actual battle they were uh, attacked simultaneously hmm. and so could provide the, couldn't provide the, the mortar support but I decided to take that out because once again, that would mean that we would have to go up to Outpost Fritchie and tell their story as well. Right. And so for the sake of simplicity, we had to make these decisions. Um, what, I, what I will say is that once the battle begins, uh, what you see in the battle, um, for the most part, and I'll explain the most part in a second, happened and happened the way that, that we say that it happened. Now, I say for the most part, because Ty Carter took us through his sections. Uh, Cordova, who was, the, who was a medical officer, took us through his sections. Rodriguez took us through his sections. We did not have um, Clint Romanshay helping us. So we had to go through the eyewitness accounts of others. Right. And we had to go through you know, what was written in his uh, Medal of Honor uh, summary and in other reports. And we think we got it uh, mostly right, but I'm, I'm sure it wasn't as perfect as, as we'd like it to be or as it would have been had he been there. Um, Romache was unavailable to us because he has his own book called Red Platoon, uh, a best-selling book. I've read parts of it, which are just fantastic. And, um, and he had a deal at another studio, and so he wasn't allowed to, to, to work with us. Wow. So... Anyway, that's a very long answer to your very good question. Uh, and that's kind of Hollywood, isn't it, right? When, when you know, you'd love to get all those pieces, but something, I mean, it's, it's horrible to, almost to say, but something of this epic nature, it makes sense that other people want well, kind of a piece but, of it. Okay, so you, you used a term there that I'm going to push back on a, a okay. little bit and say that you're going to be Hall, it's Hollywood. And, and first of all, we didn't, Hollywood had nothing to do with this. We were mm -hmm. shooting in Baltimore. Area, and with, you know, <laughs> right, right, with Gary and crew, and 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 I used um, many of the actors that I hired are actual veterans. That was a condition of my doing the film, mm -hmm. so we weren't really Hollywood. But but what Hollywood would be is if we bullshit, if we're trying to bullshit you, right? Okay? You know, we we were not trying to bullshit anybody. We were trying to be as authentic as humanly possible. What is what? There are some movies out there that are great films, Oscar-nominated films, that changed the story, you know, completely. Now, right. made them great films. For example, uh, my understanding, boy, I could be wrong, and I'm going to get in trouble if I am, but I, I don't think that at the end of uh, the book on uh, the Lone Survivor that he is with his family, and I, I don't think so. I right. think he's in a cave somewhere. And in American Sniper, this duel between this other sniper in Baghdad, um, I don't think, I know that that didn't occur. Those are inventions of cinema to make it more, um, that's going Hollywood. Now, right. um, I'm not objecting to that. 
I, I want to be very clear. I think Clint Eastwood and Peter Berg are two of the best filmmakers alive. And Eastwood in particular is, is an icon, a god of, uh, of, of directing. But they, they, there was a decision for those studio films to, to do that. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that we're better than them at all. We're just different. It's a different take, sure. It's, it's just, a, it's simply, it's simply, um, it's simply a different approach. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, but my slip up on my part, not Hollywood in the sense of um, um, I, I, fake. I, 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 Hollywood I, is I, in the sense of we, we don't, us normal people don't make movies. <laughs> you know, Hollywood makes we, movies. <laughs> we had to make, we had to make some concessions. Sure. And do some conflations. Like I, I'll give you, I'll give you another example. There's a character in the movie called the younger, right? Mm-hmm. And he's a guy that has a breakdown and has to leave. Yep. Yeah. Post, okay. So, and he's a racist and you know, he's a guy that gets caught jacking off to the wives of one of the other. That's soldiers, right. Right. That's right. And he's, he's a, he's a complete shithead. And that is the only invented character in, in the movie. I want it because I, the guys who died in this battle and the guys who fought this battle, I, I wanted to, um, you know, although we show them very humanistically and we show them with some of their flaws, um, I didn't want to um, attack their character as human beings. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to show, you know, a couple of them did fall apart at times sure. during, you know, during, even during the fight. And sure. I, I, and I didn't want to dishonor them. So what I did is I created this guy who was going to take, be the heat absorber of all this stuff. <laughs> the punching bag. That's I, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Now that's, you know, that's what I wanted. And there was something else that I did in the movie, which is there is this character named Broward played by Kwame Patterson. He is the final commander mm-hmm. um, that we see, you know, properly at the outpost. And um, he's a guy that had to be relieved of duty. He, he, for lack of a different, for lack of a better word, some people said he was overly cautious. Some people said he right. was a coward. Right. But, and, but, and, but because of his, he would never leave the talk. Um, and he, when he did go to take a shit, he would have to have an armed escort. Mm. You know, he was scared and 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 asked and didn't want to provoke the, the uh, Taliban. So you know, they would barely ever fire their mortars. Um, you know, certainly not with white phosphorus. He would. Um, um, he he didn't want to um, amp up the defenses of the outpost with, like, for example, re re upping their claymore mines. Uh, because he knew that they would be leaving soon and wanted to concentrate on on, on that and, and again didn't want to do anything antagonistic. Mm-hmm. So so he comes across real bad and, and he got and he got killed in the review of the uh, of the incident later. But I changed that guy's name. Right. right. It's the only name I changed because I didn't this guy has gone through enough humiliation. I mean you you can read it in the book, in Jake's book, but um, I didn't want to humiliate him anymore. Yeah, that I mean, that's got to be a, a hard tightrope to walk. I mean, I've, I, I think you know, I I won't speak for everybody, but in my combat experience, there are those guys that crack. There are those guys that uh, underperform. It's a, it's a small it's the small majority, but it is the reality that yeah. Well, there, it, it there's that scene in, right. There's that great scene in Restrepo where we see the guy just crying and yep. It, it, and I showed that scene. That's a scene that I wanted them to most concentrate on because, you know, you know, you know, there's something else about this movie, The Outpost, that's really unique. If you look at a movie like American Sniper, or you look at Lone Survivor, or you look at Twelve Strong, or you look at the masterpiece uh, Zero Dark Thirty, right? Those are all about the so-called elite units. The oh yeah, Seal, the Rangers, Special, Special Forces. Forces. Yeah. And this movie, these are a bunch of 11 Bravos and other MOSs in there. They're just dudes, you know, mm-hmm. they're not, they're not, a, they're, they're the grunts. They're the guys who get sent to places like Combat Outpost Keating. Mm-hmm. They're the guys who are shoveling shit and, you know, just going out on, on random patrols, you know, with no specific mission other than, just keep this place alive until we're out of here. Yeah, the regular dudes of the army, and you know, and look, this was their Thermopylae. It was horrible, and and eight of them died. 
But those eight who died were all trying to save somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, the fact that they didn't have a mission is in a way what makes them, what makes them, uh, what makes them so special and what makes the story so special. And I think the reason that, you know, people have gravitated to this film in the way that they have. And I'll tell you something else. It's the reason why women like this movie so much, I think. Is because we're not telling we're, we're not telling the story of superheroes. Right. Those women that see this movie see in these guys their husbands, their sons, their brothers, their boyfriends. They see the regular guys. When they see Bradley Cooper in American Sniper, mm. they do not see their husband. <laughs> I know my Mark, wife doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, that's what I mean. When they see Mark Wahlberg. You know, That's when, right. they see, when, when they see Ty Carter in our film, they go, I know guys like that. When they see Gallegos in our movie, they say, you know, I know guys like that. Yeah. You know, they, they know all these all these guys. And that's, that's what makes it special. Now, I, I, I do want to point out, too, that, uh, <clears throat> uh, and again, in, in touching in that, like, my experience, this is the first representation, and, and by all means, anybody call me out if I'm wrong here, the first time I've seen someone doing the burning shit detail in the in the modern era of Iraq Afghanistan war, um, I have never seen that because I had to do that when I was in Iraq and I was a private in two thousand three. I had to do that detail, and so it was were, the were you a, were you a fuck up? <laughs> no, I was the I was the I was the bottom bitch. I was the I was the new guy. I was the the bottom of the what do they call is that, it. Is that I never, I, I've never heard that term. I, I've heard it. You know what I've heard that term? I've heard that term used. That's what pimps used to call their, their girls. Right, the one on the bottom. Time. That's right. But is, is, is bottom bitch a, a term that was in the, was it? I mean, it's, I, I heard it th thrown around quite a bit. Um, no, I was, I was the private. I was the guy, like, it's the lowest, the lowest guy in the totem pole gets the literal, the literal shit detail. Like, that's. That's just how it worked. You know, if you're going to get stuck, you know, guard duty or whatever, it's going to be that guy in the bottom. Yeah. Um, and so, and of, and of course, screw ups, right? Obviously, that, that was definitely a punishment, um, but it was the cherry, right? He says that cherry is another another common uh, vernacular for it. But the idea that if you're, if you're the bottom guy, it, it, the, the job has to get done by somebody. So right. it's either usually the lowest ranked guy or the guy that just screwed up something. So I, I had that detail twice, twice in my tour in Iraq. I had to do that. And uh, it, it is the worst thing, one of the worst things a human can do. It, it, the pole is not nearly long enough. It doesn't matter. It, that smell just burns into your body. I, you, you, I, never, I never had to do that. Yeah, it, it's not pleasant. It's not, people won't sit next to you for three or four days while you... <laughs> No amount of showers will change it. It just it's I'm on sure you. Many people in the audience are relating to this right now. <laughs> uh, it, it's yeah. Um, let me ask. So, uh, are are you doing okay on time? I don't want to. I don't want to hold I've you for a, longer. I have, a few, I have a few more. I have like a few more minutes. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll knock out a couple more questions. I think this is such a great conversation. I do want to touch on something that some people might find a little sensitive. Um, I, I got your permission to bring it up. Obviously, when we were talking earlier, um, during the making of this movie. You yeah. suffered a, a, a loss of, of an incredible loss. And um, I just kind of want to share with the audience so that they can understand kind of what you went through and how how big of a deal making this movie was in that you went back to it when, you know, maybe some others wouldn't have. So, um, I mean, you, you lost your son during the making of this. So can you can you just explain a little bit about that? I was, I was preparing the film and uh, my mom called me. I, I was in a Bulgarian... Uh, pub about to watch the world cup um and i am um, my mom called me to tell me that my son hunter was um, in a hospital in michigan and when i finally got through that hospital they told me a nurse told me in a very cold way he had a cardiac arrest and um you can try to get here but he's not going to make it and it was I mean, I, I cannot begin to tell you how taken aback I was. And do, do you do you have kids? I do. I have a son. 
How old is he? He's he just turned three a few weeks ago. Three. Oh, that's lovely. Well, congratulations, man. <laughs> Thank you. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And it was and in fact, you know, all I could think about as I heard that my son was not gonna make it was, you know, you start going to all those memories and I was so flooded with all that and, and I'm and you know, this nurse is just coldly telling me that I'm not gonna make it, he's not gonna make it and and I uh, and I called my my wife and I called my ex wife who was Hunter's mother and I called the sister his sister Paige, and I said you just keep him hanging until I get there I have got to say goodbye. And I did get there uh, through the good graces of um, you know the studio and it was off I had no internet no way of knowing what was going on for you know half a day on on this flight and um, when I did get there. Um, he had, he had had a blood clot and just came out of, uh, out of nowhere. It's a music festival. And, uh, we had to make the decision as mom and I to remove him from, from the machines. Right. And so the thing is that when you remove something from the machines, you're in a countdown to their death. Yeah. And his chest is moving up and down, up and down. And, um, his, um, my, my, my daughter said to me, as we're waiting for him to die, Dad, I know that you cannot go and make this film or you think you can't, but you have to go make this film. The last time I saw my son was at that screening of a stripper at my house with all the actors seeking. It was like embedded in him. And my daughter said, if this whole film falls apart because of him, that would destroy him. Right. So I called the studio and I said, look, do you want me to come back? Because believe me, they had already started making their list of directors that were going to replace me. And I said, um, yeah, I'm, I said, I'm going to come back if you want me. And they, but, but if I do come back, you're going to have to let me make my movie my way because it's going to be dedicated to my son now. And it's a whole new fucking ball game. Right. And they said, come back. And I mean, you know, he was the same age as these guys who died in the battle. And when the families of these men found out, we, and that's something we never talked about is my relationship with these families, but it was good. Yeah. But it was amazing once he died. They were there for me. It was like they were my family. Yeah, you, and you become a member of the tribe. It's a terrible club to be in, but I understand. So, you know, it changed my whole philosophy on the making of the film CQ because I had to think about if I were to see my son die on screen and I had to have that happen, how would I want it to happen? Right. And it was with truth and honesty and not a big musical score and not and not bullshit. You know, you're going to you're going to you're going to tell it straight. And I got back to Bulgaria where we shot the film and I gathered the crew and then I gathered the cast and I told them, guys, this is not going to be easy. I'm going to bury my blood and my bones in the soils of Bulgaria. And you guys can either join me or you can be buried under me, <laughs> underneath the soil. For sure. My blood and bones. And um, I've, I've never had a crew and cast so rally. You know, Hunters, th this was an impossible movie to make. I had about 30 days to make a giant war film with a peanut-sized a peanut budget. But these guys, they found, they found a way. And we were going we to win this. We were going to accomplish this. And it was beautiful in a way. And I had a Hunter's photo up on the monitor the entire time. Anybody had something to bitch about, they came back <laughs> to the monitor, talked to me, then they would look at Hunter's photo and they would walk away. Wow. And just go deal, go deal with it, whatever the issue was. Right. So the, the actors and the crew, they were not going to let down on this set. They were not going to let down um, Ty Carter, who was there. They were not going to let down... Uh, Stony Portis or Chris Cordova or Daniel Rodriguez, and they were not going to let down the military advisors. They were not going to let down. You know who else was there? Caleb Landry Jones' brother um, was a Marine who got 
both his legs blown off in Iraq, and he was there. They were not going to let those guys down. They were not going to let me down. They were not going to let Hunter down. And I am so proud to have dedicated this, this movie to him. And um, they say that, you know, you die twice, once when you leave this earth, and the second time when the last person ever speaks your name. And let me, let me tell you something. Um, for my son and for the guys who died in this battle, Gallegos, Griffin, Thompson, Scusa, Martin, Mace, Kirk, Hart, even Faulkner, who died later of an overdose, though their names are going to be spoken for a really long time. Absolutely. And um, that was what was most important to me. And so the only thing that I can tell you, if you lose somebody that's close to you, and, and and probably everybody listening, because by the mere fact that you were in Afghanistan or Iraq, you've lost somebody close to you. Mm -hmm. All I can tell you is it helps to say their name and to keep the name alive and, you know, however you can. And so it all goes back to what I said before, where if I couldn't be with my brothers on the battlefield, you know, I'll find a way to honor them. And, you know, this is the only way that I, that I know how. It's a good thing we're coming close to the end here because I'm about to lose my shit. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that, therapeutic, um, man. <laughs> it's, it's making this music. Uh, you know, honestly, um, if I hadn't made, had this movie to make and all I had was no work and a, and a dead son, I, I don't know where I'd be right now. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I'd be alive, to be honest with you. But I am. And I just have to wonder what will life be without this film, without being able to talk about this film, without having some purpose. And so I guess I just have to, you know, find a way to figure my boy into every film. And yeah. then I'll be able. Well, and I, and I think that, I mean, that's incredible. Thank, first, thank you for so much for sharing it. The comments are literally lining up with condolences and, and be <laughs> strongs and we support you and Thank you for your service. Um, so everybody is literally lighting up the the, the chats about it. Um, well, those are, those are good folk, and I, I have really found, you know, I'll, I'll I'll tell you something. There there is a um, high ranking person on this film who shall go nameless, who is incredibly important to this film, <clears throat> but he'll go nameless for now. Which is that he was not a fan of the military, was not a fan of um, as an institution, and by extension, not a fan of uh, soldiers. You know, to him, they were teeth, uh, night between the teeth grunts. That they mm -hmm. were all super hard right wingers, which I have found yeah. is like not at all the case. Children murderers, but, uh, yeah, the whole deal. All that, all that stuff, and that they were uneducated. And he got on the set, and he fell in love. He fell in love with these people. He fell in love with Jericho and Ray, and with. Hank Hughes and Stoney Portis and Ty Carter. And, and, he, and he fell in love with you know, the brotherhood and he fell in love with fighting for somebody because they're, they're by your side and he's totally turned around and God fucking damn it, man. That's what I want people to take away from this film. You know, people don't know what's they, to, to this day. They don't know what the fuck is going on over in Afghanistan. Yeah. And to a lesser extent now, Iraq and, and maybe and maybe Syria. And that these are good human beings doing a very difficult job that may not even be a job. And I want people to fall in love with them the way that this high ranking person on our film did. Yeah. And if and I think we and you know what I think I think we've accomplished that. I honest to God do. I'm, I read the comments. I read all the Facebook and the Twitters and the emails, and we've accomplished it. And yeah. I'm really. I would. I would even say I saw uh, a post on, on the day the film opened that uh, Stony Portis, right, who's the commander of the unit, wrote in the New York Times that said about the movie. He said, "Know that you are not just watching a war movie. By allowing soldiers to tell their story, by hearing their story." You are also part of the healing. So, yes. I mean, hearing your movie described that way, like, what is what does that mean to you to be able to bring that to life? 
Well, I think I've explained it. It's it means it means absolutely. Um, I tell you, Stoney is quite a man. First of all, he's got the best name in the history of military <laughs> names. Okay, <Stoney> arguably, <laughs> it's, it's pretty close. <laughs> but his Stoney, come on. So anyway, he. Um, when I was in Bulgaria, I get a package from him. And in it, I open it up, and it's a uh, KIA bracelet with the names of uh, the men who mm -hmm. died in the battle. Yep. And it was his KIA, KIA bracelet from the battle. And I called him up. I'm going to try to keep it together now, okay? Go ahead. I, I, I called him up, and I said, I, I can't take this, Stoney. I, I can't. And he says, it's too late. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, look on the inside. And he, he had engraved Hunter's name. Oh, wow. Wow. And, you know, I think that the cynical would say that he's just really lighting a fire under my ass to get the movie right. Right. But, but the truth is that he's a kind man and a decent man. And he is, um, he's a West Pointer also. And, you know, that made me proud. And you look, this was, a, I, a, you know, we haven't gone into all the difficulty it took to make the film. The fact that we kept having our budget slashed, you know, we kept having a problem with getting weapons. We, and Scott Eastwood broke his fucking ankle right before we, we started shooting. And that added a level of difficulty you can't even begin to fathom. Um, but, you know, we were just destined, you know, we were just destined to get made. Absolutely. And, um, and so. Uh, no, that's anyway. incredible. I, I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask you one last question and we're going to let you go. Sure. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears to make it a little more lighthearted. We got into some heavy stuff and I, I appreciate okay. so, so much your, your, okay. your, <laughs> your honesty. Um, so, okay. So, so obviously through this time, this lockdown, this pandemic, you know, it's something we've talked about ad nauseum on this show about how this changes, fundamentally changes how things are done in Hollywood, how things are done, you know, streaming, uh, movie making, the processes, everything, everything. My hope. Well, I, think, I think that, I think that the, uh, literally the outpost may have changed, uh, changed Hollywood in the sense that um, they're now seeing how successful you can be as a film to download. Right. On VOD. Right. Um, you know, this movie is incredibly successful. We were number one for three weeks, three weekends straight. And right now we're number two. That's not fucking bad either. <laughs> and I think we're going to stay in the top 10 for a very long time. Absolutely. And I think that what I, I think, look, it's, it's very expensive to put a movie into theaters. And if you're not a Marvel movie or James Bond or Star Wars, um, it's very risky proposition to go into theaters. You gotta, sure. you know, create all the um, the DCPs, which are the equivalent of prints, and you gotta market for the theaters, and it's 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 a process. Then you gotta share the money with the theaters, and I think that what's gonna happen is that we're gonna make an assumption now that many many movies are gonna go straight to the VOD platform. Um, you know, there's a movie called The King of Staten Island. I don't know yeah. how well it did. I don't know how well it did. But I do know that millions and millions of people have watched The Outpost. And um, and it's number one in Canada right now. And in, in, it's open in a couple of countries around the world in theaters. It's been very, very successful. But I think that people are watching what's going on right now and saying, you know what? You know, for these sort of medium-range budget movies... Uh, maybe we go straight to straight to VOD. I know that when I'm not making a really big film, uh, CQ, I'm, my movie's going to go straight into this uh, process. Wow. And um, so I think that now, you know, it, it's hard to imagine even when theaters are going to open. I, I, I just, I, I'm just baffled by so many things. Like there is so much, like they, like football, NFL, for example. Mm -hmm. I am. You'll never meet a bigger NFL fan than me, 
I I watch, I gamble, I fantasy football, I <laughs> okay, and and I'm and all these podcasts are out there, okay. Who are you gonna who are you gonna draft? Where are you gonna draft them? What's your draft strategy? You take uh, you know, well, definitely you take McCaffrey first. You go right. to, uh, you go to Barkley next, you know, and and when you take a kicker, and I'm going, guys, what are you fucking talking about? <laughs> like baseball is about to go down again. How you really think there's going to be a football season? You know, like how is it going to be possible? Like when a team starts testing positive for the COVID, you know? Yeah. And it's the same thing with like with the movies and like you know, like we're hoping there's an Academy Awards this year. You know, selfishly we are. That would be really wonderful. But will there be enough movies have been in release for that to be possible? Right. When will theaters actually open? This movie Tenet is supposed to open um, overseas at the end of August and then in the first weekend in September in the United States. Yep. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, are, are movie theaters even going to be open? Are people going to go? You know, what is going to happen? So there is a, when are we going to start being able to film in the United States? What happens when someone gets COVID on a film set? It's very wonky right now. Yeah. Very. So. so we don't know. <laughs> We just don't want to see you. Absolutely. I, you know, I was going to say, maybe you can, you can give us a glimmer of hope here because what we've talked about before is that the, at the very least, right, the silver lining that we're trying, I'm a very optimistic guy. I want to look at the, at the, the bright side. At the very least, do you see the possibility of like almost like a, a golden age of entertainment in that because of this long pause, Maybe there's been more creative ideas. Maybe they've. Well, I wrote I I wrote a, a screenplay over this pandemic that I think is really great, and we're close to getting that one set up. Um, and just remember that King Lear was written during the plague. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, the, I, I guarantee you, they're going to be their their screenplays are lining up. There are some really good ones that have been written during this pandemic, and yeah, now there's going to be. So we there will not be a lull coming up, I, I think, so much because the the four months or five months that we haven't had movies out, there will be a glut of them coming out. So right. Twenty twenty one will be filled with them, and while they're while they're in theaters, we'll make other films like Top Gun. Those got moved to twenty twenty one. Right. I understand, and um, I don't know when it's going to open. You know, I don't know when James Bond is going to open, but a lot of these movies are going to are going to be pushed. And so while all those movies are in the theaters, we'll, we'll go out there and hopefully make movies. And um, I think a lot of movies will be made overseas before they're made here, though. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And maybe a lot, like you said, a lot of those uh, Mission Impossible, uh, all those ones that are, that are you know, country hopping, maybe Fast and the Furious goes Euro, <laughs> you know, these things where well, they, they shoot other places. This being filmed, it will be filmed in Europe. Fast and the Furious is going to be... The one that was supposed to be released last Memorial Day is now, I believe, going to be next I believe year. It's Memorial Day of next year, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, hopefully. But all right, I, I, I trust me, I can be here all night talking to you. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And let me let me just say that um, you can still see the movie on VOD on iTunes and Amazon. Um, the um, album is coming out on August fourth. I wrote the song that that ends the film. Uh, and um, you, it's called Everybody Cries, and you can uh, get that on iTunes and Spotify. And the DVD of the movie comes out uh, to your Walmart or Redbox or Target, whatever, uh, Amazon, in uh, mid-August. So Yeah, and, and, it, and in talking with your people, actually, um, I, can, I can say, they said it's okay to say, that uh, you guys are going to donate some copies to us so that we can actually do giveaways to the fans. So all these people that have been I, hanging I out was, here. I wasn't aware, but had I not, I would have insisted on. So, <laughs> hey, if we're lucky, maybe we get some signed copies. I don't know, get that out to the fans. You know, if that's, if that's we possible. Try. We try. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Rod. Thank you so much again. Right. I mean, you're welcome back absolutely anytime. Uh, this was a phenomenal conversation. Uh, you Thanks. really explained a lot of it to us, and um, I think a lot of people got a lot out of it. So, thank you right. again. And thanks for everybody's service. And I, I don't mean that as a cliche. I mean it from my heart. Thank Absolutely. you, guys. Cheers. All right. Thank you so much. We're going to go to break, guys, real quick. We'll be, uh, we'll be back in a few minutes.